a gentleman that I've had the distinct honor of knowing. I'm trying to figure this out now. Thirty. Is it Too long, years? Steve. Nineteen. Probably. Nineteen seventy-four. It's, probably 40, it's almost forty years. Right. Um, when I first met um, my friend Randy Hoffman. Randy is is president, owner, operator, CEO, chief cook and bottle washer for Hoffman Entertainment. And uh, we'll get into that in a second, but um, when I first met Randy, um, I was uh, <clears throat> just out of college, and my first job was working at Atlantic Records. And uh, my job was to secure airplay in uh, the New York tri-state area. And actually, one of the first records they handed me when I started the job was said, here, go get this played. And it was an album. Yes, it was an album. It was vinyl. Um, it was an album called Abandoned Luncheonette. And it was by a group out of the Philadelphia area called Hall and Oats. They had a previous album out um, called Whole Oats. In any case, um, <clears throat> so I didn't know a whole lot. Um, all I knew was, here's a piece of music, go get it played on the radio. And um, the manager was this guy who worked at a publishing company. And he was the manager, but he also had this 9 to 5 job. And then there was this guy who worked for him, who I later found out was really like the guy doing all the heavy lifting and all the work. Um, and his name was Randy Hoffman. So um, it's been a long time, a long road. and. He'll have some really fantastic insights and information that I think each and every one of you will find useful in your careers. Um, just to give Randy an overview, um, how many of you are, play an instrument? OK. And how many of you have aspirations to be involved after college somehow in the music or entertainment industry? OK. Anybody focused enough yet at this point in your life about where you'd want to go in, would you want to go into artist management? So, okay, so there's a couple of hands halfway up because they're not sure, and that's, that's okay, it's acceptable. So, um, I, I'm going to just shut up for a second um, and have Randy tell you how he started in the business and what his first gig was, and uh, then we'll get into some specifics. But I think his story is worth um, all of us uh, listening to. Uh, so well, thank back you very in the much. 70s. Back in the seventies. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate this. So unlike of the music business today, when I started, it was a completely different world. Uh, the only thing that I could say, what happened forty years ago and what happens today, is that Steve and I were talking about this on the way out here. Nineteen seventy-four, when I became a professional, I went from working as a roadie and a manager for a local band in Long Island, making $200 a week cash. I took a professional gig with a group called Hall & Oates for $50 a week and $3 a day per diem. Back then, even $3 was hard to eat on. But in 1974, the Rolling Stones were the biggest band in the world. And the next month, when they tour again, they will be the biggest band in the world. So some things don't change. Uh, interesting enough, uh, when how I started was like I said, I had this job, and I met this guy, and he said to me, I need somebody to work with a Mellotron. Does anybody know what a Mellotron is? You do. Okay. So a Mellotron was this, it was white. It was this big, and it sort of, you played these notes. I had no idea what it was. I'm not a musician. Um, and I got the job taking care of the Mellotron. So I became uh, Hall & Oates' roadie, and then about four or five weeks into the job, I could see that I was never going to be able to do that kind of work. And management and working with artists is what I enjoyed doing. And I was fortunate enough to have Daryl Hall look at me one day and say, why don't you come with me? We're going to deal with this record company. Why don't you come with me? And I suddenly became the road manager. And for, you know what a road manager is? OK, so does that mean most people do? Okay, so I became their road manager for three years. How I started with that is a guy named Tommy Matola. I don't know if you've read his book recently. Um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, by the way, if you want to read a good book, read the Clive Davis book. I'm reading it now. It's very informative. But Tommy Matola, as Steve was saying, was working at Chapel Music. He was the, the head of uh, 
pop music for publishing. He signed Rod Stewart, among others, but his nighttime job was uh, managing Daryl and John. So I used to go up to Chapel Music's office after 5 o'clock and work. And uh, I used to work in a little cubicle all the way up to uh, the president of the company. And I used to actually get, go to the bank in the morning and get dimes, because back then you could make phone calls for dimes. And I would book the hotels and the trips that we had to make all over the country. And we traveled. And that's how I started in this business. And I have been a manager since that day. I've never done anything else in my entire career. It's a very special job. It's if the people who raise their hands, you must understand that it's a job that is all encompassing. It's 24 seven. Managing one artist is hard enough. Managing three or four at the same time even with a staff of people, it can be very tiresome, very hard to do. But it is the most gratifying, in my opinion, job because artists are a very different type of people. So people raise their hands about being musicians. Does anybody want to be a musician from this class? OK, so you do know that you think differently than most people. That's what makes you special, different. As a manager, it's our job to take that special talent, that uniqueness that you have, and filter it to where it needs to go, be it record deals, touring, publishing, special appearances, TV shows, whatever they may be, ideas. You know, I've been working with John, um, John Mellencamp. Uh, this is my second time with him. I've been with him since 1997. We started back up again. And Here's a man that every day, seven days a week, has a dozen ideas that he filters through me. And what I've learned is never say, oh, that's a bad idea, or that won't work, or no, you should try it this way. You listen, you absorb it. You, you know what you know what you can and can't do with that. But you'd be surprised that if you just listen and pay attention, you will be able to accomplish a lot more and, and satisfy your artist and in turn satisfy yourself, which is what a manager does. You can make a lot of money, but there's also, we were talking about this today, it's the self-satisfaction, because you are the closest person to that artist. You are their mouthpiece. You are the one that speaks on their behalf. And I get involved in every level of artists except for two things. I try my best to stay out of their personal life because you can only get in trouble, as we discussed tonight. And you tr I stay out of business. Never advise an artist what they should or shouldn't do with their money. There's other people to do that. And you have enough work to do. So before we get into some of the um, aspects of artist management, let, let's follow a little bit more in your career. So you were, so you were with Hall & Oates yeah, doing? I did Hall & Oates. We did, I did Hall & Oates as the I was Matola's right hand. I, then I decided to spend, I loved going to England. I loved to travel. So I spent a lot of time in Europe. We had artists, some names you'll, you wouldn't know, but a well, Wait a minute, so he, you were Chapel. He left Chapel. He left Chapel. He formed, he formed um, Champion Entertainment. Sorry, that was the company. That's how she, when I actually met you. Right. Champion Entertainment managed, the first act that we managed was Hall & Oates. And then the second act we managed was a group called Dr. Buzzage Original Savannah Band. And then we managed a, a disco group called Odyssey. And we had other assortment of artists that we tried to break. We had our own label. So we were a full service management company. You had a, you had a label with, um, with Columbia Records. Columbia New Records. Records and we had a, was a it was New York International. New York and, and, and you had some artists signed there. We had two artists signed there. And, and then. Then later on, you had a, a, a label deal with RCA, I think. Yeah, that was the New York International. What was the one with Susan? I don't remember. Well, that was on that was on that was on RCA, but you had uh, Mike Riccadella's band network, um, network and Linky Bits and all that stuff. Right, right. A lot of acts that didn't work, that weren't successful, but we continued to, as you were saying, we had these artists and we had these ideas and labels and all sorts of things that we did, and. Um, and then one day we get a phone call from an accountant said, we'd like you to meet John Cougar Mellencamp at the time. 
uh, he's just fired his manager and I think you guys would be great and we met him and he was at the point where he had Pink Houses and all the Jack and Diane and all those songs but he wanted to be John Mellencamp and he wanted to shift and that's when that the record Scarecrow came so, so that was you should just explain a second about Mellencamp's career yeah uh, are you guys aware of you know who he is and okay so John Mellencamp started out as a fabricated pop star. He had a manager who, who was managing David Bowie, and he wanted to make John Mellencamp the next David Bowie. That's about as far from John Mellencamp as you could be, but he went with the program. And he called him John Cougar. And he was Johnny Cougar, because the name John Mellencamp is, isn't a pop star name. So they had success, but he kept trying to shift away from the Johnny Cougar, then it became John Cougar, and then it was John Cougar Mellencamp, and then we took over, and we were very influential in changing his persona with that Scarecrow record and just the imaging that he put out and that we backed up. And what we did, going back to four about working, was that we knew that this was the right move for John long term that this artist could be around for the, as he's been for the last 30 years. But it had to be done in a certain way, and we knew that we were going to suffer certain things. Money wasn't going to be the same. We had to shift it. And when we did that, it actually, at the end of the day, worked out great. But it was part of being in the management of getting him to understand what we had to do. So and, that, and that expertise came from Partially from working with Hall and Oates. Hall and Oates, yeah, because we, you know, everybody has their trial, and Hall and Oates was the trial for us, and then we knew what to do with John, and it was also the kind of music that the company, there was five of us, we loved that kind of music. We were big fans of his. So it was a big thrill for us to be able to work with him. So there's Champion Entertainment, right? Tommy's company. Right. Tommy's so company. Matola was in charge, but Matola had aspirations of being something other than a manager. And he did whatever he did in 1988. He decided, he made the move to go to CBS Records and the Champion Entertainment was taken over by the five of us and we brought in a gentleman named John Sykes who was one of the three co-founders of MTV. He came in, that lasted about a year but we, the dynamic wasn't right. And then in 1990, my, my life completely changed because one day there was this young girl who was 18 years old and I heard the music and it was Mariah Carey. And that completely changed everything that I've ever done after that. I learned the music business. I was fortunate enough to be put in a position to have to learn every aspect of the business from top to bottom. But here you are, an experienced manager working Hall & Oates, you have John Mellencamp. There was a bunch of baby bands. Some right. of them didn't really right. work. It, and you know. then there wasn't. Didn't, was this before? Or after? Like you had other artists that came in the way. You know, I mean, it was Carly, Carly? I had Carly Simon. I, I didn't have much to do with her, uh, but I had Carly Simon. I had Taylor Dane. Um, all the hits that she had, I I was responsible for her. But I think what Steve is getting is that I worked at this company. Oh, that was supposed to be off. Sorry. I apologize. I thought I turned it off. I worked at this company, so I was a part of this. With Mariah, I became the person. But also, you, you scouted talent, and you would bring. I right. remember you bring artists. I remember you bringing in the psychedelic furs. Right. At, Boomtown at first, Rats. Boomtown Rats. Bob Geldof and I were very good friends, and I thought they were the greatest band in the world. But in any company, you know, you have a, have a body of consensus where everybody agrees, and wrongly on their part and not everybody agreed with you. Well, I think what happened was Matola had a certain taste in music and it didn't, it didn't really run the, the idea of the psychedelic furs or the Boomtown Rats or uh, Tears for Fears, artists that I work with. I said before, I had spent years going back, I'm sorry I'm sweating because it's very hot, but I, I went back and forth to England on a continuous basis because that's where the music was. For the, all those years, the talent was there. It wasn't in America. Excuse me. So, but I didn't have people who shared that vision. But there was there was one exception that band from Australia or New Zealand actually. Split ends. Split ends. You aware of split ends? 
Okay. Well, they're, they're antecedents to Crowded House? Yes. So the one brother of Crowded House and the older brother, they were a band. They were the art, the art band in um, Australia. They, do, they were fantastic. They were way ahead of them, their time. And then Crowded House, Neil Finn. But these, these were projects that you were right. very much involved with. Right. I mean, while they may have had a, a manager from what, their home territory, mm -hmm. they needed somebody who understood yeah. the American marketplace. So sometimes, and it happens all the time still, I should say that, that artists who live in another country, their managers will come here and say, well, look, I need help. Because it, you, America's too big to try to do it on your own if you don't know anything about it. So in this case with Split Ends, that's what happened. They came over, they hired us, we represented them, and uh, we had pretty good success with them. Back in the day when you could have some fun, they were really, they were very unique. So that was considered a commercial success in retrospect. Um, if you guys look it up, you, you'll see that you know, Crowded House and, and Split Ends were definitely successful in their time. Um, but there were things that you worked on hard and you put the same amount of effort and didn't develop the way we had all hoped. Most of one, the time. One was, um, I think, of, um, she became a very successful, and she still is a successful songwriter, a woman named, and there's no reason for any of you in this room, unless you follow songwriters, Ellen Shipley. Right. And you, Lord knows, I think there were two albums through RCA. I mean, you, Not, me, right. we, we did everything. And this was, and if I remember correctly, it came out, there was this, it was a resistance at radio because radio was run, probably still is run, mostly by men. And there was this, well, we can only have so many slots on our playlist for current music by female artists. And I think at the time there was uh, Pat Benatar had a record out. Um, it Carol was also Ross. that it was that rock right. It was, it girl, was and Carol she didn't Boston. fit she was, that. She didn't fit it, but it was like another female vocalist. Oh, we can't do that now. So. I mean, she was a talented songwriter. She was extremely you, you, talented. You guys pulled everything, every possible string you could to get her the shots and, you know, and, and put her out on the road and stuff. And it just, for whatever reason, it just didn't. Connect. And her boyfriend at the time was a pretty well-established. Yeah, he played with Todd Rundgren, Ralph Shuckett. And he was, yeah, he had produced some. I, I think you talk about Ellen Shipley. There was a band that we managed from New York. It was five, four guys, and they, they called themselves Susan. They were fantastic band. And every one of us at the company, including yourself, we worked that as if they were the only thing that mattered to us. And we, did, we had nothing but resistance. They, the people didn't like the name. People didn't like the singer. People didn't like this. And we didn't give up. We worked on that thing way longer than we should have. But part of being a manager is that when you have this innate belief in an artist or an act, you have to go further. You have to work it. Because something can happen. Something can change. Some, Hall & Oates is a great example. The record, the song She's Gone mm -hmm. was out for three years before it became a hit. And the only reason it became a hit was Sarah Smile had become a hit. And this radio station decided, well, I'm going to go back and play this other song. And that became a hit. And that record sold five years after it had come out. So you just don't stop if you believe. And as a manager, it's your responsibility to not give up until you know or you believe you can't, go, you can't do anymore. And then you try more, and then you know you can't. That's and they're in the structure of a record company, sometimes you're lucky enough to have a driver, somebody who has the passion and belief as much as the artist and the manager do. And, and at, at Atlantic, there was a woman um, named Margo, and she just, she was tough. She was like chain smoking back when you could smoke at work and had a salty uh, amount of language. And she just would not take no for an answer. And she just would work all the secondary markets in the southeast and just build a story. And th at the time, um, Hall & Oates had signed <laughs> to a new label, RCA. So here's Atlantic with what they feel is one of the definitive songs. And Sarah Smile's a huge hit on RCA. So let's go back to the catalog. 
because we have nothing to lose. We spent a lot of money trying to develop this act. Let's try to break something and we can sell some, at the time, albums to, to recoup some of our investment. And this woman was just, she w I mean, she was relentless. And we worked with her all the years before trying to make that song a hit. So it was as much us going back to her going, let's do this again. It benefited us financially, but we also knew that song deserved to be heard. So when you do find someone like that, and today, and I'm sure you'll hear this next week when you speak to Mr. hear from Mr. Lipman, that it is, the record companies of today are not the record companies that we grew up in. When we grew up there, you'd go into the Northeast, the Northwest, the South, the Midwest, and there would be people working specifically in those marketplaces. You're lucky today if you find, if you have a New York-based record company, you have LA or vice versa, but that's about it. You don't have people all over the place. The independents like Steve was, they, they, they exist. But as far as labels go, they don't. Um, can I safely assume you're all familiar with the song um, She's Gone by Hall and Oates? No? Thank you. Okay. Well, when you get a chance tonight, I would suggest you go wherever you go to find music and just listen to that song because it typified um, the early 70s sound. And these guys were, um, they had the Philadelphia harmonies of, uh, of a soul act, but they were two w white rock guys, um, both uh, from Philadelphia. So anyway, just so you know, put it in perspective. So let's jump back to um, the Mariah Carey. The story goes that, uh, uh, Tommy at the time right. was working yes. was at a party? Tommy was at a party and a girl walked up to him, Brenda K. Starr, and handed him this tape of this girl who was across the room and said, you should listen to this. Brenda K. Starr had a couple of dance, minor dance hits. Um, and Tommy took it and didn't think about it. He got and it. And that, that's something that would occur, you know, record guys always have somebody slip Yeah, I mean, I, I get music all the time. I'm sure you get music. People say, if I have a friend, I have a cousin, I know somebody, this is great. And you listen. It's funny enough, you never know who's going to give you the next song. Case in point. Case in point, right? So, so Brenda K. Starr gave, Brenda K. Star Star gave this to Matola. It was a cassette, right? He went in the car and he played it. And if you know the story, he went looking for her the but next day. he stopped day. the car. Stopped the car. His way well, home. But no, he stopped the car and he went back to the party and right. she was gone. The other side of that story is the very next day he calls me on the phone and says, I heard the most incredible voice. You need to come over and hear this. I was the second person to hear that voice. And of course, as a manager, I said, who manages her? I have, we have to get involved. And he said, well, I haven't even met her yet. And then he met her with, his, with her mother. And he told her, I'm going to make you the biggest star in the world. And he did. And I was fortunate enough to be involved in that from day one. And as a manager, like I said a little while ago, that's how I learned what a person in charge really does. Not, a, not being in charge of a particular thing or not being a, the marketer or the creative person, but being the person that has to make the decisions. I was telling Steve the story that I was sitting in um, uh, her lawyer's office. Uh, anybody aware of who Alan Grubman is? Okay, Alan Grubman is the premier attorney entertainment lawyer in the business. Uh, you may know him, if you heard his name, it may be Lizzie Grubman, that's not the greatest story, but yeah. Alan Grubman is the best. And I was at his office with his staff and her business managers and we were sitting and I was at the table here and everybody else, it was where you are, and I kept saying, well, what are we going to do about all these deals? I've, this, this one, they've got a deal for Japan for $15 million, I have these three commercials and you know, who's going to take care of this? And they're all looking at me like you are. And I turned around literally and went like that. I thought they were looking at somebody behind me. And they looked at me and said, well, pardon my French, it's time to get off the pot. And I went, oh, so I'm the guy. And they went, yep. Called I, on the job training. I, on the job. I walked out and made a phone call to a lawyer friend of mine. I said to him, I'm going to give you $5,000. You need to meet me tomorrow. And I said, here are all these contracts. I don't want to know what the party of the third part says to the third part. I want to know, the, I want a one sheet. I need to learn about this. And I got first class on the job 
kick-ass training. But I, we sold 77 million albums. She made hundreds of millions of dollars. And I got what anybody in this room who wants to be a manager can only dream about for an education. I learned everything. It was as good as, it was, go, it was like going to, going to college, I guess. I don't know. It was just absolutely amazing. But that doesn't happen all the time. That was, I, just, I was in the right place at the right time, and a 19-year-old girl, for some reason, liked me. She trusted me. And we spent eight years. We traveled the world together. We, like I said, we, we did everything. I... So you go over to Tommy's office, and you hear this demo tape by this woman who's an amazing voice. Now you're told you're going to handle her affairs and be her manager. So when did it, the reality hit you that, like, wow, we really have something here that's going to work commercially? Because you hear raw talent all the time. No, no. I, I, and it, was the, it was her, the fact that it was the songs, because she wrote it, all the lyrics. It was the voice, and there was nobody like her. And you just knew. Besides, you had Tommy Mottolo before any kind of relationship happened between them. You had Tommy Mottola, you had Donnie Einer, you had a team of, of, at Columbia Records who were all geared up to break this artist. It was going to be the next Whitney Houston. So when you were, we knew the talent was there, but you hear that all the time, but we knew how the setup was gonna go. Don't forget, all of it was set up, what conventions to go to, how to go to radio, what visits we were going to make, what the image was, what a poster would look like, the bio, everything was there. It was all put together to be successful. So where were you when you first realized, wow, this is really happening? Uh, what was that moment? Songs are released on a Tuesday, right? Well, well record, ads record, on Monday and Tuesday. Record companies release music, and for some antiquated reason, radio stations decide to change their music and decide what songs they're going to play, what songs are going to move up, what songs are going to move down, which ones, new songs they'll put on, in rotation. Which come on out. A, on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays. On Tuesdays. Tuesday. And then they report that to trade publications, which don't exist anymore. Um, but now it's, a, it's probably on a website. And so that's how a promotion person quantifies their success or failure, and that's kind of part of your, your weekly report card. Who got the most new stations to play their particular song this week? What are you competing against? You know, how, did, how did we do against the competition? So um, that's the marketplace. So on that Monday of the, when the record company went for ads. So that's the first single? That was the first single. Which was what? Um, Vision of Love, right? C came out the Monday, we blew the competition out of the water. Tuesday is the second day they finish up the ads. I think we had like 130, it was ridiculous. We were all looking at each other going, oh, okay, this is real. It was the number one most added. Everybody was talking about the song. They didn't know if she was black, if she was white, who she was. They just knew that this was unique and it was something they wanted to play in the radio. Second thing, that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the phones at radio stations lit up requesting the song. So we knew going into the second week, it was only going to get better. We did that for four weeks and then put the album out. When we put that album out, that album flew off the shelves. Now, do, you do you remember where you were when you first heard the song on the radio, what the circumstances were? No. Or did you remember the first conversation I remember Mariah calling. I remember. Girl, I remember. I remember being in Matola's office with Donnie Einer, going, "Jesus, did we really do this? Is this really happening?" Because there was again, there was nobody like her. Whitney was already Whitney. She was 25 years old. She had had her success. There was nobody had come in, sort of become the princess. And uh, but let's let's step back for a second. Let's be fair. I mean, she goes in the studio, songs she wrote, the right producers, the right musicians, the right mix, all that. But that's not enough. I mean, you've got to convince all, this, all these radio guys across the country. And if I recall correctly, the, the Columbia Records machine, because it was a machine, 
decided we're going after this one and we want this one. That was the one. And, and everyone at radio knew, okay, this is what Columbia Records is putting their, their on the line for because this is the record, this is the next big thing. But it wasn't just like a phone call and say, hey, this no, is no, no, you, guys, you guys did some no. amazing stuff. Set up. Uh, there was the R&R convention, radio and records convention. Trade publication. And Michael Bolton was a huge star at the time at radio. Before he did TV commercials. Right, before he was, he was the one. And he was doing something at R&R. Um, &R, and we decided that what a great introduction for her would to come out and sing a song with him. And he came, she came out, and here was this little shy 18-year-old girl in the black dress with the curly hair. And she blew everybody away. 30 minutes after that performance is over, which was the, en the end of the convention, uh, Columbia had taken a suite, which they did every night. And they had Mariah come in. And we, I remember walking into this room and being told by the head of promotion, all you need to do is make sure no man puts a hand on her butt and just follow me. And we walked from here to there. She met every single person who mattered in radio. And when we finished with that, we knew what we had. We just knew that it was going to be that big. And it proved that it did. But it didn't mean that we didn't work a hundred times harder because we knew we had a chance to be a big success. I, I think I also recall you, you guys did a fairly extensive um, promotional visiting campaign in major markets. Worldwide, yep. So Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, Boston, Philly, Nashville, Florida, Texas, Seattle, San Francisco. And what we did, we walked into every radio station and said hello to every single person, got on the air. They were already playing the record, but we, as Steve said, we wanted them to see that this was a real person. This wasn't just manufactured. That was the only thing we had to worry about, because when you get a record company to put that much of a push, sometimes people think, oh, that's just, they're just putting their machine behind it. It's not really real. And we had to prove that she was a real artist. And then we traveled the world. We did it. And funny enough, her success in the rest of the world, with the exception of Japan, uh, took four albums before it was successful. Well, what we did was we would travel to Europe, especially to England. There was a television show called Top of the Pops, which was a weekly television show that England had for 50 years. And we, every time Mariah put a song out, we would go and go on that show. So even though she didn't have success with all of the songs that she had in America, there was a song by an artist called Nielsen, it was called Without You, and she put that out. And because everybody had kept seeing her in England and Europe all the time, when that song came out, it became an instant smash, and that album that, that was on, that was the fourth single in America and the, and the first one in, uh, in Europe, and we sold 18 million albums outside the United States. But I spent six months Living out, living outside of the United States, we traveled everywhere. And then, as the manager, I saw all the potential, so that's what I did. So, what I'm trying to get the point across to the class is that this wouldn't have happened in any other way if it wasn't on a major label. If they didn't, if you didn't have the resources and belief and passion and commitment from the staff, and that just in the in the rock mind sense, that would never have happened. You, no. This, this is music not, that not needs a, pop, a machine. Not with a popular artist. If you look at today with Mumford & Sons, that is the complete opposite. Right. That label has decided, they decided, they found the gem, and those guys have done everything they can to have success with that. But that didn't happen back then. That I, kind of music wasn't as popular either, Steve. Right. And I, I, I recall a mandate, you have to go see this artist, they're doing a showcase, they rented a studio, and they played some selections from the forthcoming album. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I believe I was at MTV, and this was like 
this is matters, this is important, and you got the chairman, president of CBS Records, Columbia Records, saying, this is going to happen, and we want you to be part of it. And it's a commitment, and you know, and you feel the corporate body enveloping everything. And while it has, look, at the end of the day, you could have spent all the money, gotten the right songs, the right producers, could have had the best engineer and mastering. The bottom line is, if it's not a great song, it's not going to stick. Because I can't, nobody here can make you, you, or you, or anybody buy something they don't like. If it doesn't hit you here, and I call it the responsive chord, then it's not going to happen. So it's the bottom line to all these stories, whoever we talked to this week, Randy, but you got to remember the bottom line is it's got to be a hit song. They knew that Harry Nilsson song was going to connect because she could sing it like no one else could. But they were fortunate enough, uh, her co collaborator Walter. Epinesia. Yeah, it, it got to have hit songs. That's what it matters. So all this doesn't matter. Could have done everything he's talked about, but if the songs weren't there, because other guys have tried replicating this kind of success with other artists, male, female groups, they forget. It's got to have a hit. That's, what, that's the bottom line, and you've got to always remember that. One of the smartest guys in the music business, long dead, Brian Epstein, managed the Beatles, a whole bunch of other British acts back in the 60s. He was asked by a disc jockey one day on the radio in an interview, so Brian, what's the next thing? And here's like the Beatles, who are like the biggest band in the world. He's got half a dozen other British invasion artists. And he looked at the disc jockey, without missing a beat, he said something very important. He said, a good song. A good song's the next thing. That's the bottom line. It doesn't mean, and you've all heard them on the radio, you go, why is that song on the radio? It happens. But I think, Steve, it's not just the, it's the, people can have a hit song, but they won't have a career. And there's so many one-hit wonders. More one-hit wonders than you could imagine. Oh, I like that song. What have they done after that? Oh, nothing. And what we, as a manager, that's, the, for myself, I have always tried to work with artists who, are, who write their songs, who collaborate with people. And uh, I, for me, picking songs for somebody to sing, you know, I'll leave that to Clive Davis. He does that really well. But you've got to if you want to be a manager you've got to really look at the artist and see can i spend the next 10 15 20 years with these people do they have a career that i can be proud of you know can i be a part of it can i help and so far in my career i've been able to do that this was prior to tommy's relationship with cbs no no he was at cbs he was at cbs mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay, so we have this, the Mariah project is huge, exploding globally. Um, Tommy has his relationship with the woman that goes where it goes. Um, so it went up and went down. That went up. Well, okay. So, but Randy Hoffman is still there, still wearing your hat as manager. Yes. So, I mean, you I was fortunate enough to spend 18 months after they got divorced to work with her. That was the hardest 18 months because I knew it wasn't going to last. Circum I was too close to Tommy, but I was also very close to her. We had a very nice, I had, for a divorce between two people, a parting of ways, it was the nicest thing that ever happened to me because she took care of me. We never said a bad word. We see each other, we smile, we say hello. We spent, again, though I was 20 some odd years older than her, it was the beginning for her, and it was the beginning for me. This was her career going, and I was going along with her. It was my career was going. So it just was one of those things that it had to end, and it ended the right way. And, and you knew that there was a, the clock was ticking. Yeah, I, I, knew, I knew before, I knew way before that. So what does Randy do to maintain your status as a manager? I, Not only with her. No, but I was very lucky. I was, I, was, uh, I was able to meet an artist, the only artist in my life that I regretted not continuing to work with, and I made a, I made a tactical mistake, was, you know who Maxwell is? Okay, Maxwell is the, the best male R&B singer I've ever he heard, and I worked with him. Um, we had a ton of success on the one record I worked with him. Just unfortunately, uh, 
the record company was a bit too close to him and I was caught in the middle and I made the decision not to work with him and I regret that even as we speak today. But uh, I went and managed, I got how, how did you get? How, how did you get hooked up with Max? Uh, Don Einer set me up with a meeting. Don, Don, Einer, wanted, was Don of, Einer was the president was of Columbia right. and he said Maxwell needs a new manager and I think you would get along with him great. We got along. Maxwell needed someone like myself and we worked together. And then from there, I was my I had an office um, in the Hit Factory studio that is now Condos. And uh, I uh, was working one day and I heard that John Mellencamp was downstairs in the studio. He was making a, a record. And I went down, we had kept in touch, and I went down and said hello. And he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? And blah, blah, blah. Next thing I know, I'm managing him. And then I went from there and then I so I was on a kind of a roll after that, which was good. Uh, Julio Iglesias, the father of, of Enrique, uh, I got asked. I was very, let me back to, I was very close. And as a manager, this is a good thing, but it also can hurt you. I was very close to the people at Sony. The reason I was close to them was I worked with artists that were very successful. But... It was, it was always told to me, remember how you got where you were. Even though at the end of the day I did the work, it was not, it was put out there that, hey, we helped you get where you are. So Julio Iglesias, they came to me and they said he needs somebody who understands the American market. Next thing I know, I'm managing Maxwell, I'm managing John Mellencamp, I'm managing Julio, uh, Ricky Martin, they called me and they said, Ricky Martin needs somebody to really try to get him back on track in America. I'm doing that. I've got two or three other artists that I'm working with, and suddenly I became this person that I never wanted to be. I was like, I was this manager. And all, what I did, and as I told Steve, for myself, I started, my time wasn't working with the artist. It wasn't doing the things I said at the beginning of this talk. I was just, I got to make money because I got nine people working for me. And if this one doesn't work, I got to get that one. Oh, I'll sign that and I'll just do that. And that's not the way I, wa I wanted to be as a, be a manager. Uh, so eventually I wound it, wound it down to, you know, to what I wanted to do. But that's what I did after that. So I, I had a good four or five years where I was in control. And, th and then... You, you were in control, and then that implies you weren't in control? No, what it meant was I decided to change what I was in control of, and it didn't matter to me so much that about the reputation of being this manager. I wanted to get back to what I was doing before. I wanted to work with artists that I could help, as opposed to it became about the money. And believe me, it's nice making a lot of money. You get those checks, they're, they're really nice to look at. But then when you realize between the government and the nine people that you're paying, because you have to have good people working for you. you. You cannot work and do this by yourself unless you do like right now I manage. Mellencamp is my, my main client. So I don't have five people. I have two people who work for me. But then it was, it wasn't, my mindset wasn't where I wanted it to be. So you just, I just you decided. I, I'm gonna, I decided I'm there was. John. I decided to stop doing what I was doing, and I was changing my life. My personal life was changing. I I had met somebody I wanted to get married to, and life moved from there. So, but John doesn't work twelve months out of the year, even though he calls. He ha he has John. John has worked for five straight years where I could make a living where most people would be very envious. This year we're taking a bit of time, so you do other things. Uh, so now you have a couple of other I, I just, you have are you, uh, anybody aware of uh, an artist named Hugo? He had, uh, he did a cover version of Jay-Z's song, 99 Problems. You should, you should check it out. It's, it's really good. So I work with Rock Nation. Spell, spell Hugo for that. H U G O, like Hugo Boss without the boss. Right? Anybody? Does it sound familiar? Yeah. So he's he's an artist. At, he lives in England in Thailand. He's half Thai. Excuse me. He's half Thai, and uh, we made a record with Rock Nation through Epic. 
uh, 99 Problems did really well, uh, and now he's making his second record. And I don't make five dollars from him, but I believe in this guy. I think he's I think he's he's a rock star. He's got the swagger. So to me, it's like you've got, like I said before, I believe so. I do everything that I can do to help this guy. And I have another artist. His name is Will Daly out of Boston. I don't know if anybody knows him. And I've been working with him for the last five years. And Will, we were on a major label. It was terrible for us. And he just uh, raised $32,000 a Kickstart and made a record. And now we're going to have somebody mix it. And we're going to put it out through an ind independent label. So that's, now that's, that's interesting. Your experience with Mellencamp, major label, Mariah, huge Columbia machine. And here you have an artist who doesn't work on that machine, but you're taking the opposite approach and saying, okay. Because it works for him. It, it, it doesn't work the other way. So that's part of your ability to be a proper manager is that you can customize your approach for the client's needs. Yeah, because I see what's going to work. And I think if he has any chance at all, it has to be done this way. So as his manager, I realize that that's what I have to do. So $30,000 will get him started? 30, he made the record, and we're going to mix the record, and he'll probably have about five grand left over. But you can do that today, Steve. You know that. You can make records for $5,000. You know, what the Lumineers' first record cost? Five grand? The first police album yeah. was done for five thousand. I mean, right. But in today's world, you could do that. People yes. do it all the time. So you have to adapt to what, if you believe in something, you have to adapt to what that particular situation is. Another, uh, did you have another client too? Yeah, so you all know who Johnny Cash is. I would hope that you guys would know who Johnny Cash is. Okay, so Johnny Cash was married to June Carter, and June Carter had daughters. One of them is Carlene Carter, which was Johnny's stepdaughter. Uh, about a year and a half ago, a publicist named Bob Morales, who used to run Warner Brothers publicity, uh, publicity for 25 years, Madonna and you name it, he, he was in charge, uh, came to me and said, she, I, I think you should meet this woman. She's really nice. She's got a great idea. She has no direction at all. I met her, got along great. She had an idea. She wanted to make a Carter family record. Now, I know nobody in this room, with the exception of maybe you and Steve, know about the Carter family music, but it was... It was very cool, early folk country music. And Carlene used to sing with the Carter her family when she was five years old. So she wanted to make a continuation of that record. I went, all right, no disrespect to you, Carlene. And this is what sometimes a manager steps into a certain area and has to be careful. I said, Carlene, and no disrespect to you, but no one's going to care about Carlene Carter, unless someone produces this record that is put weight behind it. There's two people to do this. One is T-Bone Burnett, who I'm very close with because of Mellon Camp, and two is a guy named Don Was. I don't know if you know Don, but he's one of the biggest producers in the world. And Don produced the record. I made a deal with Rounder, and the record's going to come out in January. And I do believe this girl, at 50, this woman at 56 years old, is going to have the record that it probably won't win a record of the year for the Grammys. It may get nominated, but I would bet money that she will win the country, either country record of the year or the Americana record of the year. It's that good. Am I going to get rich from this? No. But you know what this did for me? It gave what you talked about. It gave me satisfaction right here. Every time I listen to this record, I go, I did this. I, I put this together from soup to nuts. Again, I keep going back to it. As a manager, that's part of what we have to do. We have to figure things out. Because artists can give you the ideas, but they don't necessarily know how to implement them. And that's my, uh, my staff today, my artists today. But I'm going to California next week. There's a young girl, 20 years old, that I, her name is Emma, and I think she's got all the good. She writes, she plays five instruments, and at 64 years old, I go, I can't believe I'm going to go do this again. But I, I got a feeling a year from now, people will turn around and go, oh, I remember, I heard about that girl. So. One 
thing that filters through all your management experiences and touched on it a little bit last week also. Um, big word, only a couple of letters, but it applies in any relationship, male, female, marriage. In this case, still management is trust. Trust. It's intangible, unqualified. Number one thing. And it's, you, obviously you had that and you still have that with your clients. But, I mean, that seems to be like one, like one A to be a successful manager. You have to somehow embrace trust and then make your artists feel that way too. Do you, uh, John Mellencamp would not spend his time with me if he didn't trust me. Loyalty and trust go to hand in hand. You have to have, they have to, they have to feel comfortable that you're speaking on their behalf. I said to Steve on the way here, I went, one of the things when I talk to an artist, be it a new artist or an artist I'm, that's established, is I've earned the right to have an opinion, and my opinion will be heard. And if I think I'm right, I will go at you every which way I can. But at some point, be it a new artist, like I said, or an established, if I'm talking to you, and I tell you, this is the 17 different reasons why we should be doing this. And you finally look at me and go, dude, I don't want to do it. I don't think you're right. I don't believe. Whatever the, your bottom line answer is, as a manager, if you want, that artist, you want that artist to trust you, you stop. And you go, OK, I'm done. And never bring it up again. And when you take that thought and idea that he has, to suppose, that you have, and you go to your, the record company, or you go where you're gonna go and have a conversation. You never let them know, well, I think it's one way, he thinks it's another, because you just lost. Because the next time you have that conversation, they're gonna ask you, hey, so uh, is that him saying it or are you guys saying it? And I learned with every artist, and I, I'm very proud of the fact that no artist has ever said that I've ever said anything to anybody when they've told me something else. And that's loyalty and trust. Because an artist, they're coming from a different place. It's hard for them to trust. Because their thought process is different than the normal person. So when you get the opportunity to, to earn that trust and, that, and show them the loyalty, then you, know, you can do very well. You can be a very happy person. I like the word loyalty. Yeah, you have to be loyal. Life is about loyalty. Your loyalty to your family, to your friends, to your loved ones, that's what life is about. If you're not loyal, then... I was just thinking of the David Geffen documentary. You know, the one on HBO and the loyalty thing uh, collapsed with, um, who was it, the woman? Was it? Laura Nero. Laura Nero. Yeah, and that collapsed, you know, because she went over right. a jump ship and so on and so forth. Well, if you look at the managers today, Irving Azoff, Eagles, trust and loyalty, how many years? John Landau and Bruce Springsteen, trust and loyalty, how many years? Think about artists that have been with their managers. You know, I've been fortunate enough with John Mellencamp, with the exception of the time I took with Mariah, it's been 25 years. It, you, that, has, that's, that says something about you as a person. You know, you can be trusted. You are loyal. One of the most, we talked a little bit about this earlier, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful manager and, and quite figure in the um, music industry, Irving Azoff, um, he has a roster of artists that he's had for decades, whether it's Steely Dan, the Eagles, Joe Walsh, whatever. Um, he and his partner, Howard Kaufman, who Overseas Fleetwood Mac and numerous other artists again don't have contracts. They have no paper, and their thought is Joe Walsh doesn't want to be my client anymore. There's nothing I can do to force him to do it. I can take him to a court of law, but I can't make him. I can't make him write a song. I can't force him. I, I guess can't make him want to stay with me. Right. So harkens back to legal so of what value is there creating a management relationship 
on a piece of paper, or is it just like a marriage with a, yeah, before you get married, say, um, honey, um, can we have a prenup? Because it's really kind of the same thing. You're in that, and the piece of paper, as far as I understand, really only protects both sides in the case of a breakup. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand what Irving does. I do the same thing. I've had a handshake deal with Mellencamp since 1998. I had a contract with him the first year that we worked together. It was very uncomfortable. I didn't need a contract. If he wants to fire me tomorrow, he's going to fire me. As I said to you on the way here, that if we have a business, I've just made a very big deal for, for John with the person you're seeing next week, right? Um, if I got fired tomorrow, I'll get paid on that deal. And again, it goes to trust, and it's got to be a two-way. So Irving doesn't need a contract with the Eagles, who have been with him for 25 years. Landau, I don't know if he has a contract or not with Bruce, but if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. You have to, in some ways, it probably is easier not to have one, because it shows even more trust and more loyalty. Now, on a new artist, I, I always have a contract. Why? It just it's a different situation. I don't know where that relationship's going to go. Somebody gets in somebody's ear. Anybody watch Dancing with the Stars? Okay, so Kelly Pickler, the girl that is probably going to win this thing if she doesn't fall down. I, I managed her. And I gave her a number one album and number one single. Um, not I gave, but I was instrumental in country music. But she wanted me to move to Nashville, and I wouldn't move to Nashville. I had papers with her because I always felt from the first day I met her, and we got along great, but it just wasn't sure. Well, because of that contract, I was able to make a substantial amount of money that was, would be due to me anyway because I had that contract. So I think when you don't really know somebody and you haven't established that relationship, that trust, then I think that's a smart thing to do. Sir, Sorry. it seems like you're saying that like the longevity of the person that you know or the artist that you know is what really makes trust work, essentially, because a lot of new artists nowadays are scared to trust anyone because they're afraid of being taken advantage right. of. So like, you know, you knowing Mellencamp for so long helps you to trust him in order to pay you, like right. even if you get fired tomorrow, mm -hmm. someone like Kelly Pickler, you might not be able to trust her right. because you don't... It had to do with, it had to do with the, the, the time of the relationship. And if you're a new artist today and you've got, you know, you got a buzz going on and you've got five people like myself coming at you, you've got a, it's like instant marriage, you understand? It's like you meet somebody and you go, well, I think he could be really good for me. You don't know anything about that person. It's like somebody said, I just got married last week. I met her yesterday and I got married. It's what happens. So this is, this is innate feeling for somebody. I've been in the situation where I've met with people and I knew I wasn't going to get that artist. Just not, you could, you could feel it and you have to, you know, you just, I met with Bette Midler. I had the greatest meeting, I didn't even tell you, I had the greatest meeting with Bette Midler. I spent three hours with her. I thought she loved me, right? But I also knew what she was looking for and it wasn't going to be me. I still gave it my all because I thought that I could really do great work for her. But you just, every situation is different. But I think the longer, they, the longer you have that relationship with someone, the, you know, the more trust. So as a kind of like B part of that question, so would you think that, you know, um, do you still keep in contact with Kelly Pilker just in case like, you know, something else can happen? I, I, actually, I actually texted her last night and told her that I thought she was fantastic and she should keep her hair short. Did I get a response? No, but that's not the point. Uh, but like, even like just showing like gratitude or kindness will, you know, maybe someday she'll need you again and you can maybe benefit from that. Yes, and by the way, not only do I do that, one of the things is, is, as a manager that I've learned is when one of your fellow men and women get promoted, get an opportunity, something happens, it's the greatest thing is when I get, like something happens and I get an email and it says, or a note that says, hey man, great job. It makes you feel good. I, one thing is, we all, we're a small unit of people in our business. And it, you know, we need each other. 
Him and I know each other for how many years? 40 years? We're in the process right now of trying to put something together for this Mellencamp, Stephen King, Thibault Burnett musical that I'm pitching series about what we need to do. So if I didn't have a relationship and didn't keep the relationship and Steve didn't keep his relationships, nothing would ever happen. And, and Kelly Pickler someday may be put in a position where someone that you're chasing as a client or thinking, they're thinking about you says, hey, do you know this guy, Randy Hoffman? And you know, oh yeah, I used to work with him. Right. And you want her to say good things. Only one say good things. Because the other you know, axiom here is it's a grapevine business. Everybody knows everybody else. There's no secrets, or very few secrets. And so if he does dirty by me or screws me over, and somebody asks me, hey, is Randy any good as a manager? You know, I have a choice. I can not say anything, or I can use that sweet Which, by the way, is as bad as saying something. Right. Or, you know, my mother told me, if you can't say anything nice about anybody, don't say anything. You know, that's not a good thing to say. Yeah. So you, you want to keep, you know, um, much like, I guess, a divorce, you want to keep everybody happy and saying nice things about you because you just never know where. Maxwell will be having, you know, a cocktail with some young act and he's been talking to them and they go, yeah, we're talking to a bunch of people. Who are you talking to? You go, oh, he's a good guy. That's what you want. I mean, it's a grapevine business. So one of the rules is, you know, be nice to everybody. Or Tommy Mottola once said to me, always say yes. I don't know if that's the greatest advice. That's in the not world. the greatest advice. But that was, that was one of his, his things. You so have to remember everybody who goes up comes down. To what level you come down is, you know, whatever. But uh, I've seen so many people who are on their way up, as you have, Steve. And when they're not, and they start calling and asking you, and you just look at them and go, see you later. Because they're only, they're only using you again. So. I, I always say be nice to everybody. Um, it's so easy to be nice. It's not hard to be nice. It, it, it's harder to be rude to somebody. You gotta figure out, I'm gonna be rude to this person. Just be nice, say, okay, whatever I can do. Look, there could be somebody out here tonight who is gonna wind up being a very talented artist or align themselves or in a band or maybe manage an artist and they need somebody and they go, yeah, I met that guy, he, was, he, he spoke in my class, Randy Hoffman. Yeah, let's go talk to him, he's a good guy. You, you just don't know. And, that, and that's, that, that's the way you have to treat people. Yeah, everybody deserves a level of respect and be nice to everybody. Like you said, it doesn't take a whole lot to do that. Um, switching things a little bit, as a manager, it's a hot button uh, with a lot of people, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with the term, 360 deal. The infamous 360. Does everybody know or are familiar with the term and what it means? Okay, so it's fair. So you as a manager, you got, you got some... Managers ass. do not want to have 360 deals because you're giving up too much. But in the world that we live in today, since dollars are so scarce at labels, you have to go with it. What I said to you before, what I don't like about 360s is that everybody gets them. So if you go in and you make a deal with Joe Blow Record Company, they got six other racks that they've made the same deal. So it's basically the same thing. They take the records, they put it against the wall. If my record sticks, I'm in, I get the, the push. If this one sticks, I don't get the push. And then I'm stuck. And you know, when you have an artist that goes out and makes $100 and you're giving up 20% of that $100 to the label, right? Are you really gonna pay them the $20? Uh, when Robbie Williams made his deal with his label in England for, six, I think it was $60 million, he was doing a world tour. He was gonna gross $100 million. They were sharing in that from day one. But most of the time, they don't work. We were talking today. You look at the Nickelback deal, they did 360. Their last tour did not work. Madonna's 360 deal, you know, She's not make, they're not making the money back. There's so many people that have done these deals with these companies who aren't record companies. Live Nation is not a record company. But the record companies, they feel that they have to be able to share in everything. So you go along with the deal, and you know, 
And then what do you do when you have success? You go in and you renegotiate and you change that deal. So if you're successful and you're paying 20%, you'll go back and try to lower it to 10%. But they are a part of the business now. When, when, when you and I started, um, you, you put out a record, got it on the radio, people hopefully bought the record, created the demand, and then you put the band out on the road and went on tour. <coughs> now today, the fragmentation of media, it's, it's backwards, it's upside down now. It's like you need to create a demand and a fan base before you take it to any sort of media. Okay, so touring a band, as you will tell... It's almost impossible to it's expensive. get it. It's almost impossible. So when you say a 360 deal isn't fair, okay, so where are you going to get the money from? You're not going to go to a bank or take a second mortgage on your house or um, go into indentured no. servitude. So That's why you do the 360 deal, because you're going to get the money. Okay, so to be a new band and break... You have to do a 360. You don't have to do, but somewhere you got to borrow the money. If you're in a situation where four or five labels, or two or three now, that are there who want to sign you, you're going to get a better deal. Right. But if, if you have one person who says, I want to sign you, but this is what I want from you, and you look and you go, well, the alternative is I have nothing, then you're going to make the deal. And you'll get some tour support. And you know, if, you're, if you've got a good manager, they're going to put it in the contract to give you a certain amount of tour support, a certain amount of promotion. Which is support. usually recoupable. It's all recoupable. Um, it used to be 50-50. Now it's 100% most of the time. So I find it interesting in this day and age where um, record companies are reluctant and don't really want to advance a band for tour support where now we're seeing the advent of the major labels getting involved in EDM and electronic dance music, where for sure you don't need any tour support. You need a plane ticket and a flash drive, and um, you're off to the races with the, with the right uh, setup. Yep. So it's interesting how the commerce in that case may have influenced the art to the extent that now um, Sony created an imprint um, taking back Patrick Moxie from Ultra and saying, okay, you're going to be the president of worldwide electronic dance music for Sony. I mean, I think out of necessity, aside from the popularity of that art form, it's also a pretty efficient way to make money. Most of it, yeah. You can. I mean, it's a whole different thing than what, um, what, what you and I have been talking about. So the 360 deal might work for a new band if they have to go out on the road and they need to find some money somewhere. If it's part of, if you can secure tour support, not based on success, but you get the commitment that part of helping you try to have success is they'll put the money, then yes, you go, all right, I'm going to make that deal. And as you pointed out earlier tonight, the record companies, you're fortunate enough if they have a representative in, in New York and L.A. So a lot of times I think you're forced in a position of having, having either to force the hand of the label or out of your pocket, hire some and outsource some services. So maybe it's you need an outside PR firm, like you mentioned, Bob Merlis. Um, or maybe you need somebody to help gather some additional radio exposure because the label has three other priorities mm -hmm. in, in the chain. Again, that costs money. Where, where does that money come from? If you're an established artist, you'll pay for it yourself. It becomes part of doing business. If you're a new artist, you're going to hope that the label wants to be a part of it. And may th they may not be a part of certain things. They may say, well, right now we don't, we're not going after a radio track on this record. We're not going for a single. Do you know what it costs today to promote a pop single? Anybody have any idea? What's the figure now? A anybody want to guess? Sorry, I just said it. Cost, it costs, am, am I right? It's about a quarter of a million dollars to, to, go, af to go after a, a single. For, let's say you have a, a, an alternative track and you work it up to it becomes a, a hit at alternative radio. And then you want to cross it over to Hot AC. And then you have to work it to get Hot AC. And then you cross it over to Pop. That could cost you a quarter of a million dollars. 
And in any given moment, that could stop. And you as an artist, if you're lucky, you, you and your manager have made a deal that only 50% of that is recoupable. Most of the time, it's 100%. So let's just say you have an album and you go after three tracks because they believe, all right? And they go after it. You could spend a half a million dollars or more. That's just trying to have a hit. It's not counting, I got to go on tour. I got to do this. I've got to have the proper website. I got to have promotion people. I have to have marketing people. Because labels today, they outsource a lot. Because they just don't, they, the money's not there anymore to pay for all these people and all the expenses that go with it. Another, another subject, um, the visual packaging, the, the video. Um, your old client, John Oates, gave me a quote once. He said, growing up as a kid in Pennsylvania, I used to love playing music in the garage, having a good time. And then I found out it wasn't good enough to write hit songs and play the music, but you had to look good, too. You had to look good, too. How am I supposed to look good, too, and do my music? And that's an unfair additional burden put on any artist back then when MTV mattered, and even probably today. Again, how important is that to you or for your clients to have the right, or what they feel is the right artwork on something, or make the right video well, there's a big difference. Artwork today is, in my opinion, less important because where do you really see it? You, you know, when we, when we grew up, you'd go into a record store and you could pick up the album and you would look at, you know, any, the Doors record and they would have all this stuff on it. You'd turn it over and you'd read it. Today, everything is this big. So that's the artwork. That's just my opinion. Visually, I think, when you look at a, when you look at a new group, do you care what they look like? Or you just like the song? I mean, I, I care. When I saw Duran Duran came out, they, were, they looked like nobody that came out at that time. It was the visual. I, their songs were good, but they had such a unique look. You know, when all these artists come out and they, and they, they pay attention to it. The Boomtown Rats, the guy who got the best look in the band, not the best look, but the most coverage was the guy who wore pajamas. He wore pajamas every day. That's all he ever wore. But it was so unique that people started wearing pajamas. People wanted to. So I think visually, it's important for an artist or an act, male or female, especially females today, because the competition is so hard. I mean, you, you look at Rihanna. I mean, stunning woman. You know, every day, it's, some, it, it's a different look. So I think visually, it's important. Videos today, Steve. Ah. Where do you see them? Yeah, but I mean, again, they're not like what MTV was, where they were these kind of videos. And people aren't spending. But the people here in, in this room didn't have. I they, understand. They didn't have the concept of having you sit in front of a television and wait for their favorite I, video. I, I know, but that's why I'm saying to me, I'm not sure they're as important. Are they important to you? Tell me. No, 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 but he's talking about videos the now. Videos yeah, okay. So if you saw a video... See, you just said to a point, right? When I'm talking about it, it was everything. If you didn't look good in the video, you were screwed. Didn't matter about the song. It was like, you, you didn't look good, you didn't perform. Can anybody here adequately feel they can describe what Nickelback looks like? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> no, okay. Which one is that? That's Chad. Okay. Yeah. Avril's husband. Okay. No, it's, it's and by the way, they're a really good band. Their time it may has come, may have come, but they were a really good band for the music they played. There are some bands that didn't have the advantage of video exposure, and uh, and not saying Nickelback was by the way, um, and their faceless bands, and sometimes you wonder if it hurt their career or not. Um, the worst case of that um, was Millie Vanilli, where they looked great, but that wasn't the band. Because if you saw the real band behind that sang those songs, it was just a bunch of studio session people. So um, let me, let me uh, 
let me move forward here in the interest of time and let some of uh, these questions um, <coughs> maybe you can answer. So Matthew asked this is a good question, Andy. What is the biggest obstacle you had to overcome while being a manager? Realizing that the day that I said in that meeting about Mariah Carey, that if I didn't figure this out right away, I, it was over, in my opinion. I was going to be not what I wanted to be. So that was the biggest obstacle in my life. That was, a, that was one of those take a look at yourself moments and figure it out real quick. Um, here's a <clears throat> interesting question, and if you are uncomfortable answering it, feel free to say pass. How did you feel when you were secretly wired up hoping to get information from a witness during <laughs> Mariah Carey's infringing years? It was really weird because the son of a wouldn't come to the table and answer the question. I did everything. I had that briefcase because this is, this is public knowledge, so I'm not saying anything out of school. I had that briefcase sitting next to me for two and a half hours. I grilled this guy like he was a, I was the cop in, a, in an interrogation. I don't think everybody knows what you're... Oh, well, somebody answered so, Who so answered that question? Sarah. Oh, okay. So what she's saying is that Mariah Carey uh, had a number of lawsuits against her for songs. And this particular one, was, uh, was a, it was for Hero. This was the one time that I guess, access is very important in, in this situation. In other words, what this person was saying is I had access to somebody who knew her. And I gave that song to this person. Well, at the time, we didn't know if it was true or not because we didn't have enough proof. We just knew that the person, the, the particular person that you're talking about, I just, he didn't have the same relationship with Mariah as other, others did within the group. But he made the claim that he did, and he was also fired before this. So the lawyers said, we've got to get to this person. And the only way to do this legally, believe it or not, it's legal, is that someone has to be wired and someone has to go and try to get this guy to admit that what he's saying isn't true. And as a manager, I was the one. So just like I am today, I had a briefcase and I walked in to this guy's house unannounced and I spent two and a half hours trying to get him to admit that he was probably not thinking the right way and he didn't fold. I was fortunate enough to keep records of everything that I did and I found the smoking gun, I found a, 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 um, my diary and I had written a bunch of information about the song and I had forgotten about it and I found it and then the case was dismissed because she, did, she wrote the song way before this girl did. So anyway. And luckily, you didn't run into Tony Soprano. No. I, uh, later on, I had to take him out to dinner and tell him, though. I was told that. He said, uh, he, said he knew. I don't believe he knew. But he said he knew. Um, Where did you find that? Uh, <laughs> your homework. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> did you, uh, Sean wanted to ask if you always aspired to be a manager, or did you have other endeavors you would have liked to pursue? No. The, the day that I got into the music business was the day I knew I wanted to be a manager. I love working with artists. It's about the coolest thing you can do. Except probably B1 is a little cooler. Um, Ian wanted to know about the process that you went through to get Mariah Carey to be on MTV Cribs. Um, did she enjoy it? Which one was, because I don't remember that. Who asked that question? Ian. Was this the one where she uh, lost it? Um, she was in like a really nice kind of penthouse apartment in some city. They lived in the village. I think that was after me. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I think that's when she was really making the effort to become more urban. I don't, I don't remember that, so I'm pretty sure that wasn't me. Sorry. Sorry. This is a good one. Nick asks, when did you have your aha moment? That's when you realized that 
You were somebody in the business. You were a player. Well, it should be when I got, when I first, when I made the huge deal for Mariah the first time. But I think the real one for me was Sony wanted to do a commercial with her in Japan. And I negotiated that deal. And on Christmas Eve, they told me that they didn't want to make the deal unless she would do a certain thing that just wasn't going to happen. And I said to the guy on the phone, well, I, want to, I know you don't celebrate Christmas, but it, my Christmas present to you is I'm passing. Thank you very much. And I put the phone down, and I knew that they were going to call me back. And I woke up Christmas morning and got a phone call, and they said, whatever you want. And I went, aha, I did it. That was my first one. OK. Um, <coughs> Ruth asks the question, when the mu with the music industry changing as time goes by, what do you think is going to be the next big thing? Musically? Ruth. Who asked the question? Ruth. When you say the next big thing, do you mean? Well, I guess with music wise, I was changing to like um, to dance music and everything. But after that, do you think it will go back to? Well, I think you'll, if you look at now, as the dance music is doing what it's doing, you're also seeing the, the Mumford and Sons revival of the music. You're seeing that, and you're seeing more, uh, I hate to use the word, but more credible music. Uh, musicians playing instruments. It's becoming very popular. If you, you, and I think you're gonna, you look at the Avid Brothers, you look at the Lumineers, and you know, I, could, I think that you're starting to see that, which is very good for people like myself. Your hand is. So you're seeing like a kind of a resurgence of the instrumentalist. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but do you think it's going to come to this like cookie cutter point, like it did back in the '80s, where you have all these hair metal bands playing the same songs over and over again? Well, I think as record labels always do, they sign one too many. You know, when I was managing, um, when Britney Spears came, and then there was Christina Aguilera, and there were others. I was working with Jessica Simpson. Jessica Simpson, though, though she really, I, I don't know if she is today, but she was a really good singer. She was a great gospel singer. But she wasn't meant to be in that world, but somebody had to sign her because we have to have that girl. We have to have that. So if, I think you'll probably see one too many. I, I neglected to ask this question, but, um, sort of touches on it. Um, Alex, what advice would you give to an artist starting out today versus decades ago? And I guess the question, the bigger question is, the changes you've seen when you started back in the 70s today, what's, well, what's, what are the major differences? When you were an artist back when I was working, if you were a new artist, you were, if, if you had people believing in you, you had a, a long moment to try to have success. Like you were saying before, there were Hall and Oates never would have happened if their first record came out and did twenty two thousand pieces. So today, an artist is if you don't have a certain amount of following on YouTube, etc., you don't people you're only gonna get a moment. You know, unless you get Danny um Mumford and Sons. What? Danny Daniel Glass. Danny Glass. Daniel Glass is an exception to the rule because he only signs people that he's going to be able to work with for a long time, and he wants to he'll promote that. But most places, you get one shot, so you better have the package ready to go. So it's a, it's very different than when we when we started. We knew we could plan. We knew so that. So it's we, the shortening of the opportunity. The opportunity is a moment, Steve. It's a moment. It's a moment. So gone are the days. Um, gone are go the days of going out and playing in front of 50 people, 100 people, having this radio station p come and support you, meeting that per person who likes you, and word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth, and the next thing you know, somebody plays your record and you start to happen in the Northeast, and you go back five times to the same place, and the next, you know, then you become successful. 
most of the time that doesn't happen today. It's like, what's going on right now? I encourage those of you who want to explore that topic. Um, on YouTube, there's a um, speech on Fleetwood Mac. And uh, forgive me for not remembering who conducts the talk, but uh, the, the example of Fleetwood Mac is because they played Madison Square Garden tonight and last night, um, is it took them probably eight to ten albums before they exploded with the Rumors album. And I know this probably sounds d like dated music to most of you, but Warner's, Warner Brothers Records really believed in that act and kept putting out album after album and it achieved certain success at both radio and sales, but it didn't happen until they exploded with that one distinctive album. And that, it, that's always used as an example because that would never, ever happen to No, but they were also a different situation because right. Stevie Nicks and uh, the guitar player were... But that's even before they were in the band. Yeah, but I mean, they, they were blues band before. Right, they, they kept morphing with different personnel changes. Um, so maybe that accounts for some of the uh, consecutive interest that Warner's maintained with them, although they were an album company that prided themselves on, mm -hmm. on artist development a pretty antiquated term in today's environment. As you said, one and done. If you don't do it, goodbye. So your, the answer to the question is it's a, a briefer shelf life a, opportunity. And like I said, it's also the kind of money, too. Back then, it didn't cost the kind of money to promote a record or an artist because you could build it. You know, if you found one or two people that believed, Steve, you did promotion, you found one person to right. play the Grand Parker record one person to play that record and then that person you could have that person talk to that person and said I'm getting good response from that the phones are ringing off the hook etc cetera, etc cetera. you could do that you can't do that today you don't get the, you don't get the time um, Samuel asked the question what would you say was the magic because it is magic behind Hall of Notes is six consecutive multi-platinum albums teamwork dedication and Daryl Hall's voice. The teamwork was all of us. The dedication was them and us. And Daryl had the most magnificent voice. He's 67 today. And not today, but he's 67. And when, if you ever watch Daryl's house, I don't know if anybody's seen that, his voice is the same as it was when I worked with him 30 years ago. I mean, it's incredible. And he just hit a chord with people and the songs. So that's the secret sauce. So that? That's the secret sauce, mm -hmm. the whole notes. Um, Julie says, or asks, what is your favorite thing about managing artists? When an artist gives you a thought or an idea that you think is virtually impossible to do, but you figure out how to do it and it's successful. And then you say to yourself, ah, I really did that. In spite of whatever people say, I actually was able to do that. That's my favorite thing to do. It's a very big question from uh, Ashley. What are a few of the key roles of a manager? So if somebody said, manager does confidant, there's... Yeah, I mean, it, it, there isn't a few... Who, who's Ashley? Sorry. Um, it isn't really a few, a few things. It's, it's all-encompassing. I mean, literally, I can have... I use Mellencamp because obviously I have the longest relationship with him. But in any one day, John will call me and... It will be an idea about a, a record or this Ghost Brothers play that I've spent 13 years working on to, hey, listen, I'm coming to New York. I'd like to go to this art museum. Can you make sure I can? It's just, it is what it is. It's management is what you make it. You know, yes, there are things that I don't do anymore that I, that I, would, I did in the past because I have people to do that, but it's, like I said, you're the closest person to that artist. So it's whatever it is. And uh, earlier you said that you do everything but like get involved in your personal life and everything. But 
but with someone who you've been working with for 25 years, how can you, you know, make that decision? You, you just do it. So, so uh, I'm sure everybody is aware that uh, John is, um, well, I'm not sure, but John, John has been dating Meg Ryan for well, a couple of years now. And um, you know who Meg Ryan is? All right. So he come, she lives in New York. Uh, John's been here countless amounts of time in New York. I've seen him once in New York. We had a business meeting. I called him up and I said, listen, it's time for a business meeting. I'm going to fly out. He goes, I just spent a week in New York. I said, yeah, so what does that have to do with business meeting? You're in New York. You're doing what you do. I need five, six, seven hours of work. So I just try to, when I say you're not involved in it, you don't, you don't infiltrate yourself into it so you become part of the, whatever decisions are being made. It's you a business are, relationship. It's yeah, it's a business relationship. We get along. We're, we're, we're friendly. But I, you know, uh, with all my artists ever, except maybe Mariah because she was so young. But even then I acted like an uncle. It wasn't like I was her buddy. So you try to keep it separate. And as far as money goes, that's just my own personal choice of not wanting to, to know. I don't just, I've never done, I've only done it once and I regretted doing it. So I just never get involved with it anymore. So. So are there any more colleagues than friends? Yeah. But see, that sounds negative and it's not negative. Oh uh, yeah, I don't mean it negative. No, no, what I'm saying, no, when I said that, it sounds negative, but it's not. It's because you have to still be that person that can get that phone call and make that decision. And if you're talking about personal life and, you know, like I know everything John does, but I still have to be that person that says, hey, John, what about, you know, I don't think that's a good idea, and here's the reasons why, and we can separate the, you know, the two, two situations. I, I, I don't. I don't want to make it sound like a commercial, but you've referenced it a couple of times, and I don't want people walking out of here tonight. So saying, Ghost Brothers. Talking about? So Ghost okay. Brothers. Yeah. So you talk about loyalty, trust, and you talk about perseverance as a manager. So to make a very, very long story short, I will try to keep this as brief as I can. 14, 15 years ago, uh, John Mellencamp has been with CAA the Creative Artist, Artist Agency in LA. He was the, the second client to sign with them. Hall and Oates were the first. Both of them were our art, champions artists. The one year he left, he went to William Morris. I was not involved until after he had made the change. And there was a gentleman named Arnold Rifkin, who was the head of William Morris, who also was the partner with Bruce Willis in all of his films. And Arnold had this idea that John songs, because he's such a storyteller, he should do a musical based on his songs. And he set up a meeting with the head of uh, the Broadway division for William Morris, and he said, I'm bringing this director who is a huge fan of yours, and I think this is the person. He's an up-and-coming director, and his name is Joseph Mantello. So if you know anything about Broadway, Joseph Mantello was wicked and you can keep going. So they came in and made a fantastic pitch and John was like, yeah, okay, if you guys want to do it, go ahead. Well, I knew there and then that that's not what was going to happen. And sure enough, a period of time later, John calls and says, listen, tell them they can use some of my old songs, but I want to write new songs as well. All right. Fast forward. I don't want to use my old songs. I'm going to write all new songs. Fast forward, he says to me, I got this idea for a musical. I, he owned a cabin in the woods and there was murder there and things happened and he said, this would make a great story. I said, he goes, I, I want to meet Stephen King. I think Stephen King would get this. So I pick up the phone to CAA and I make arrangements for John and Steve to meet. The good thing is Steve a, is a closet rocker and he loves John Mellencamp. So John flies to fl Florida where Steve, you remember when Steve got hit by uh, a car? Remember that time, that was years ago? He was recuperating, that's how long this has been. So Steve and John meet, John comes back and says, Steve's gonna write the story. He's not gonna write the dialogue, he's gonna write the story. Now we're making a record, in 2001, 
in Florida, and John calls me up. I'm in, I'm in Florida, and he says, you got to come and read this. And there's a 72-page story called Ghost Brothers of Darkland County, written by Stephen King. And it's a horror story about bro dead brothers and live people, all these different, and the devil, and all this stuff. So we all get this and go, this is fantastic. We got to find a writer to do this. We get this on Broadway. And John says, nope, I only want one person to do this, and that's Stephen King. Well, Stephen King, as you all know, writes about a book every day. And it, it was like, well, I can't do this for four years. So we waited for four years. Steve wrote, changed. We did, did readings in New York. And it kept evolving. And then finally, we took it to Atlanta, to a regional theater. We had a fantastic run. Um, it's not going to go to Broadway today. So what we decided to do, we made an album with superstar singers uh, like Chris Christopherson and Sheryl Crow and Nico Case and Elvis Costello. Will Daly's on it, on and on, Ryan Bingham, et cetera, et cetera. And we're putting that record out June 4th. And then in October, we're actually taking the play and putting it out on the road for a month. And this thing has been in my life. I was 49 when I started with this, and it's 16 years later, and I'm still dealing with it. And the reason we're dealing with it is there's this innate belief that this can be unbelievable. And we've never wavered from it. And, you know, I'll probably retire before it uh, goes anywhere, but at least I will give it a shot. So this record comes out June 4th, and if you buy the record, you can probably read the, the script that's in there somewhere. So that's, that's the story. That's Ghost, Ghost Brothers, Brothers of Darkland County. That's the short version of it. And that demonstrates loyalty. Well, yeah, it just also it d demonstrates when you believe, it's not, even more than loyalty, when you believe in something and you have your artist believing in it the way, we're coming in town, you're going to see them talk on David Letterman, Stephen Colbert, Kate, Katie Couric, Charlie Rowe. We're going to really go out and promote this because we think we've got something special. So. Okay. So that's Ghost Brothers. That's Ghost Brothers. And John Mellencamp. So if you go on ghostbrothers.com, I think you can see a really, or Concord Records, you can see a really cool 30-second uh, little video of what this is about, and you'll get a good sense. Okay, let's go back to some questions. Alyssa, um, another Mariah question. Do you think that because Mariah is so talented, you encountered less problems while she was recording? Um, less problems in what? Who asked the question? Alyssa. Um, like in general, I know it could be kind of difficult when recording, like if someone, I don't know like exactly the whole recording process, but I'm sure you encounter problems with the artist and recording. Well, she was a studio rat, so it made it a lot easier. She lived in the studio. She was not a live performer. We had, it was very hard to get that change. I remember when we, we did a tour of eight shows in America. Now you, anybody else, Steve will tell you, can do eight shows in 11 days, 12 days. We did eight shows in eight and a half weeks because the people around her thought that the voice, you know, it was over, it was just an overprotection situation. But she was a studio rat. I mean, she made the Christmas album for six months. And we had dead Christmas trees all over the studio and Christmas lights and Santa Claus showed up and, you know, was that so, for her, there was never a problem in the studio. I think the problems were more about preparing for it because we were in situations where the last record was so successful. How do you top what that one was? You know, and that, that was really, up until the time that she put that album out with the song Honey on it, Every record had been more successful than the other, so that's what was more about the preparation than being in the studio. She loved to sing, so she would just go in there and hang out for 14, 15 hours a day. Um, I think you answered this already, but I'll just make sure. So 
Joseph want to know what your involvement in protection of Mar Mariah Carey was under her many plagiarism and lawsuits. Were there many? There were, I think, four or five, if I remember right. Who asked that question? Uh, okay. So um, sorry. Uh, well, when you're a young girl, well, uh, let me take that back. When you're a young artist, because it didn't matter about being a girl, when you're a young artist and you have all that success coming at you, all the time. I mean, just imagine going to France and going on a Champs Elysees, and 18 to 20,000 people are there for an in store appearance on a Tuesday. And then the next day you're in Frankfurt and 15,000 people. You're in London. And it's, I mean, it's insane what was going on. So when something negative like this happened, it just became bigger in everyone's mind internally. So my job, because I was the elder statesman, my job was to calm it all down. I knew she didn't do anything. And I told her, I said, you know you didn't do any of this stuff. These people are either trying to come at you for money, or in some case, they really believe they wrote that song. And we just have to show people that it's not true. I was reading something too online that when she was in the studio, they heard her say, oh, I keep having this like, tune stuck in my head. And that's kind of why they believe that she was plagiarizing too. I think most artists I know, they get a certain idea in their head. You know, they hear a song. But I can tell you, unlike others who I have, I mean, the, the classic story is, uh, I think it's the Bee Gees. They were, Morris Gibb, who's no longer alive, was on the stand and they played a song and he said, oh, that's my song, and it was the other, the other song. It was almost note for note. So I think with her, I mean, I'm sure at being 19, 20, 21 years old, they were, she was influenced. I mean, you know the song by uh, Stevie Wonder, um, Part-Time Lover? You know that song? Sure. Okay, I know you know it. Play that song and go play Man Eater by Hall and Oates and tell me if you don't hear the beat. I'm sure Stevie Wonder heard that song. You know, it didn't. But with Mariah's case, it, it just was, there was so much. the same producer. Huh? Wait, wait, who produced that? No, he didn't force her to do that. No, no, no. Was, it, was it Margaluf and Cecil? No. No, I think they did the programming. This, he this might have been a programmer. Yeah, that's funny. But, uh, so I think it just, everything got very in, intense. When, when she lost all those Grammys that night, everybody was going around. Don't forget, everybody around her was very young and inexperienced because that's just the, na the nature of what it was. And I was the older, experienced person. So when that happened, I'm the one that walked in and said, guess what? We lost, so what are we gonna do? Are we gonna cry or are we gonna go have fun? And she looked at me and said, that's why I like you. And we went out and had fun. So, you know, I mean, it was just more about all the other stuff that made it in, in more intense. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank okay. You. <clears throat> Anybody have a, another question they want to ask that they didn't um, write down yet? Well, I do. Um, <clears throat> he does. Oh, go ahead. Um, Sorry. You know, well, we all go from like being learners to being doers, you know, and then some of us go from doers to being teachers. Do you teach like the people underneath you? And uh, like, when was your moment um, when you realized that you were doing stuff? Not like your aha moment, but like your, oh wow, you know, I'm kind of doing this now rather than still learning. Where you were, you know, well, you always learn. I learn. Yeah. I learn. I learn half a dozen things tonight, just by questions and looking at people's faces and seeing people who were had a look on their face like, oh, I don't quite get what he's talking about, or oh, I get that. So, you know, you always learn. But again, I am much older than most people I deal with. So it's part of my nature to be a teacher. I'm fortunate enough, I'm, I'm an older dad. I have a son who's almost three. So I teach every day. So when I'm working with people, you know, I have the wisdom behind, behind me. So I, I like to do that. That's when he asked me to come, it was like, this will be fun, you know, because I've done this for f uh, 40 years, so. Well, artist is brand. She has a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Up. Sorry. Um, I want to know your, um, I know how you did Mariah Carey, so I know you mentioned Rihanna. Uh, what is your opinion about 
uh, dealing with female artists versus male, do you think it's harder to make that one female pop over a male, <laughs> male artist? It depends on the artist. I mean, most, mo the females that I've worked with have been really pop driven, so there's so much else that you have to do, you know. It, it, talking about management before, about you, you asked a question about all the different things. I know more about hair and makeup than most women know. I used to know lipstick, lipsticks, lipsticks, um, colors. How to, what? That, that's too much. The eye, why you make her eyes look too black? Because it's just part of what it is. Um, so. I lost the question. I'm sorry. I was. No, 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 no. The question was confusing. I just wanted to see, like, do, like, kind of towards, you know, how there's only usually when it comes to female artists, it tends to be that one. Like, you know, how Rihanna's that one right now. Mm -hmm. I guess Beyonce is kind of still there too, but she's kind of been there for a while. Versus Rihanna, who's kind of like the one who everybody looks at right now. Mm -hmm. Nicki Minaj, the female rapper, she's the one. So I just wanted to know, like, do you think that's always been? Like well, Rihanna's the one, Katy Perry's another one, Lady Gaga's one, though I hear people today say she's not, she's over, which is the most ridiculous thing in the world. But I get, they're different types of people. But working with a female artist, you just have a lot more to deal with. You know, the easiest thing for me is you work with one guy or you work with a woman who's a folk singer. And then it's you and the guitar, and you go about your business. But when, you, when you're fortunate enough to work with a Rihanna or a Beyonce, the rewards to that, not all, financially and others, is very satisfying. So as much work as I had to do with, for Mariah and with Mariah, it was very satisfying because you were a part of so much. Did I answer your question? Okay. Anyone else? <clears throat> well, I just want to throw one final question. The artist is a brand. So where do you see, you know, aligning an artist with a particular product? If Pro, you can con, do it and it works, it's fantastic. I had in the last, probably the last 10 years, the biggest branding opportunity an artist could have that didn't work. And that's the Chevy commercial for Mellencamp. I can tell you that all the singers on that record bought houses from the amount of money they earned. John earned a ridiculous amount of money from that. It was a commercial that I never knew how much money somebody could spend to sell a product. But the timing of that was totally wrong. Do um, you remember when the U2 put out the, uh, the iPod, the commercial? So that commercial came out ahead. And that, Uno Dos, that song, right? That song went to radio for 30 days before people saw that commercial. So even though U2 is an, obviously an alternative band and alternative radio embraces them, that song had another life. So when the, suddenly that commercial came, nobody called that, oh, that's that song from the commercial. When John had your... Um, the, our country come out with the, are you aware of that commercial? Okay, right? Um, when that came out, that came out in September. His album came out in January. So the, so the financial rewards were ridiculous. When that album came out, people talked about, oh, that song on that record is from, is the commercial. So it took away from what the branding of that because what I had seen was the Bob Seeger opportunity you know, on Like a Rock. Right. We were following Like a Rock after 10 years. So uh, this was their m change and we were the ones. And if that had, if we had done it the way I wanted to do it, not the way it ended up, I think you would still hear that song today. That would have been their brand, but they had to go away from it because it just got so much negative. Spike Lee told us, said the greatest thing. He told, walked up to John at a Vanity Fair party and said, I have to tell you two things. I hate that effing commercial, but I sure wish I had one. 
So, so it was financially a great deal, but didn't accomplish. Nor did nor did it hurt him. No, it didn't hurt him. It just didn't. I think what it did for us, though, is it it made us think twice about doing it again. I mean, we had a Burger King commercial. They asked to take. Uh, R-O-C-K and take the instrumental version, they offered him $2 million last summer, and I turned it down. That's a lot of money. Yeah. But the reality is, do I want and does he want to hear R-O-C-K instrumental on a Burger King commercial with people with hats on dancing, and it's just a wrong image. So artists like John, you have to be careful with. Artists like Beyonce and others, it's just more about what they do. It's part of the, of the new way of promoting people. I mean, look at what Taylor Swift did with um, the pizza. Well, what's that pizza company? Yeah, yeah she did pizza. She, every, every, she had a picture on every pizza box. It didn't sell five records for her. It just made everybody who was ordering that pizza that gets delivered to the house, everybody saw Taylor Swift on it. That's just part of... If I, had a, if, if I had a new artist today, especially a female, I would, would do all that stuff. I wouldn't think twice about it. Because it really doesn't hurt you. It only just gives you another opportunity for people to talk about you, as opposed to someone else. Okay. Anyone else out there want to throw a question? Speak now, forever hold your peace. All right, well, um, I want to thank Randy for coming out tonight. Um, told him I'd only keep him to a certain time. Quite and right. I appreciate it. I do want to say I thank you very much for this. I'm sorry I was sweating so much in the beginning, but uh, thank you for ta thank you for thank you for coming out and I hope I at least said a few things of interest tonight. Thank of you. you. Do.